Let me ask you please to open your Old Testament to Psalm 107. The first thing that we will do in this short study tonight is read that psalm together. It is lengthy in terms of psalms, about 43 verses, but I want to walk through it with you. I want you to hear the whole of it, and really all we'll do tonight is examine some of the content of it. If nothing else comes out of tonight's study, I hope that you see the richness or are reminded of the richness of the psalms. On the back table, we have a Bible reading sheet that we just go through month after month, cycling through the New Testament, but we're also reading through the Psalms, and we're around Psalm 115 or so today. You could easily pick that up and start tomorrow. A Psalm a day is really good stuff. A Psalm a day allows you to praise the Lord in unique ways that use words that are different than your own limitations in the way you praise God. Psalm 107. Uh, before I read it, quick story. I'm going to be using this Bible right here. This is this is not this Bible has seen some better days here. It's it's you're going to need to vacuum up here, Joe, when I'm done from this Bible. I don't know the story of it. I found it in my library there. It looks like it's been thrown in a lake or something. But here's the story of it. It's a version that is unusual from the read at this pulpit. It's the NLT version, the New Living Translation. So it's not particularly old. I think this was published in 2006 or something. But we opened up our gifts this year. I didn't give this to the kids, but we opened up our gifts on Saturday this year on the 24th, and we got Ella a new Bible. And it's called an Inspire Bible, and it's got marginal notes where you can write a bunch of things and fill in some things. And to make it easy for her to read, we ventured off of our normal New American Standard version, which she's got one of those too, and we got her the, the New Living Translation. And so we sat around that morning, and we enjoyed Christmas, and she loved the Bible, but then she got Legos, so that, like that. So I just kind of grabbed her Bible and walked into the little cubby hole in my room, and the read for the day was Psalm 107. And I thought, I'm going to read Psalm 107 from a version that I've never read from before, and it was really beautiful. In fact, it had this, this wonderful kind of cadence and flow to it that I thought was so rich that I instantly thought, you know, I'm going to spend a Sunday night and just show this to everyone. And I wanted to read from the New Living Translation. But this, I wanted her to have hers tonight. This is the only one I could find on the premises. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it for you. And you have two options. One option, you probably don't have this version, so you could just follow along in whatever version that you have and your mind can make all the little connections. Or if you don't mind tonight, maybe just, uh, maybe just listen. Because it'll be different enough that it might even be distracting if you're trying to compare them. So let me begin by doing that. I'm in Psalm 107. I'll give you some verse cues along the way. A couple of things that might help as we get started is there is a phrase. It's not worded this way in the New American Standard Version. But four times, you're going to hear it in just a moment. Four times in Psalm 107 in the middle stanzas, you hear these two words. Lord, Yahweh, God, help. And that's our topic for tonight. I want to talk to you about how to cry to God and when to cry to God in those kinds of ways. So be listening for Lord help. Also, Justin, just it's almost like you read it before you got here. His prayer tonight about the Lord's faithful love. You're going to catch that at the very beginning at the very end. Okay, I'll give you verse indicators to say we're on verse 10 and 20 and 30, but let's just read it together. This takes about 38 minutes to read. Now, like three minutes. All right. Psalm 107, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless, hungry and thirsty. They nearly died. Lord, help they cried in their trouble, and he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things that he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Verse 10. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. They rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. This is why he broke them with hard labor. They fell and no one was there to help them. Lord, help. They cried in their distress and troubles, and he saved them from their distress. He led them from the darkness and the deepest gloom. He snapped their chains. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he broke their prison gates of bronze. He cut apart their bars of iron. Verse 17. Some 
were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food, and they were knocking on death's door. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word, and he healed them, snatched them, and snatching them from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things that he has done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Verse 23. Some went off to sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. They, too, observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest sea. He spoke, and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths, and sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits' end. Lord, help! They cried in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nations. Verse 33. He changes rivers into deserts springs of water into dry, thirsty land. He turns the faithful land into salty wastelands because of the wickedness of those who live there. But he also turns deserts into pools of water, the dry land into springs of water. He brings the hungry to settle there and to build their cities. They sow their fields and plant their vineyards and harvest their bumper crops. How he blesses them. They raise large families there, and their herds of livestock increase. Verse 39. When they decrease in number and become impoverished through oppression or trouble and sorrow, the Lord pours contempt on their princes, causing them to wander in trackless wastelands. But he rescues the poor from trouble and increases their families like flocks of sheep. The godly will see these things and be glad, while the wicked are struck silent. Those who are wise will take all this to heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. All right, can I do it again? I think I've read this every day. I just love it, and I want you to love it too. So read the Psalms every day. Read Psalm 107 more than once this week. Mix up the versions. There's so much to talk about here. Lord help will be our theme, but as Justin prayed, I just want to note he starts verse 1. His faithful love endures forever, and he ends in verse 43. See in your history the faithful love of the Lord. First thing I want to share with you, number one in this list, the faithful love of the Lord is available to all, and the faithful love of the Lord is always available. You can be wandering in a storm on a ship. You can be in chains based on your own behavior. Anywhere you are, you can cry to the Lord, and the Lord will hear that cry, and in his wisdom, he will help you, and he expects, in every one of these cases, he expects us to cry to him with confidence, to receive his reply, and to praise his wonderful name. In fact, I like the way it opens, because in some senses, you should already know what that's like. We are a redeemed people gathered here for worship because we know that God does this. And in the early verses, he says in verse 2, Has the Lord redeemed you? And you say, well, yes. Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. There's the sense in which the psalmist is talking to people who are already in the arms of God, saying, don't you know that God did this for you? Tell everyone what God can do. What a year this would be. What a year we're looking at in 2023. If we are redeemed, having cried to the Lord for help and received it, and we tell that story of redemption to all and to any. Now, a couple thoughts here as we move forward. Any trouble, your trouble, any trouble, every trouble, cry out to the Lord. That's the theme of this psalm. And after the intro and some conclusion stuff in the middle, there are four stanzas. And that's where these phrases are found. And what I find interesting is he's probably, doesn't tell you who the author is, but he's probably taking you throughout Israel's history. 
He mentions in the very last verse to look back into your history. The, they wandered in the wilderness and all the different things that they suffered along the way. And it might be about Israel's history, but ultimately this is a timeless song about everybody's history, about yours, and also about what is coming in the future. And so when I show you these four elements here, and you're going to see some points here on the right, there are different situations wherein you need to call to the Lord for help. Now, I could just say you need to always cry, and you do, but here are four situations that you might find pop up in 2023. Number one, verses four through nine. You may find yourself wandering in the wilderness. You may find yourself destitute or hungry or depraved. You may find yourself without everything you took for granted, feeling completely empty and abandoned. And what I find interesting about verses 4 through 9, and this is not the case in the next two stanzas, is there's no sin mentioned. And when I read this originally, look at verse 4 again. Some, uh, some wandered in the wilderness. And think just sort of generically wandering through the challenges of life. Lost, homeless, hungry, thirsty, and near death. It doesn't say it's their fault, but it is kind of their problem. And you might find yourself in that place. It's not that you've sinned and you're being punished. It's just things are not working out and you find yourself near giving up. What did they do in that place? In verse 6, it says you cry to the Yahweh Lord for help. Here's how it works. You cry to the Lord for help. You beg for his help. You plead for his provisions. You cry, he rescues he leads you to a place of safety, verse 7, but he's going to expect something as a result of that. In verse 8, he expects that you will praise the Lord for his love. You will praise the Lord for the things that he has done. You will praise the Lord, verse 9, because you were thirsty and he gave you a drink, just like he did with Israel. You were hungry and he filled you with good things. Number one in this list of four things is even if it's not your fault, if you find yourself without, you can try every avenue of this world that you like and you may get temporary reprieve, but children of God look to the heavens and cry to the Lord for help and we believe that he will help us. Faith is a huge element of this psalm. We'll finish with that in a minute. Now, for some others of us, we may find ourselves in prison. We may find ourselves under bondage of sin or consequences or guilt or humiliation and shame. And while I would like to tell you, I don't know why that happened to me. I think it's just the wilderness. We know why it happens. Sometimes we find ourselves in destitute, depraved situations because of our own sin. And that's the second stanza that begins in verse 10. It changes things. It doesn't just go from homeless in a wilderness. It goes to being chained and imprisoned, verse 10, in iron chains of misery. Why am I in iron chains of misery? Because I rebelled against the words of God. God gave me counsel, verse 11, and I choose not to take it. And it might be, are you ready? It might be that the weight that you are under and that you feel is something God has done to you. He has put you, and if you think about Israel's history, he led them into captivity. Other people did the chaining, but he led them in to show them that you've got to do it my way. And any time you choose not to do it my way, all that will result is slavery. Of course, spiritually that's true. And that you can only serve one of two masters, the God of heaven or the God of this world. And this God enchains us, imprisons us, and destroys us. So what do you do? What do you do, especially this stanza, if you've never become a Christian? You've just kind of been plugging along, but you feel captive. You feel destitute. What we do is we turn by faith to the Yahweh creator, existing one, and we say, Lord, help. I'm in trouble and I need you. Verse 13, cry to the Lord for help and he will save you from your distress. Even though you caused that distress, you made it happen. He will lead you from darkness and gloom. He will snap free your chains, but he's going to expect some things. If you're somebody who's already been broken free from the chains of sin and death, he's going to expect some things. He's going to expect not only that you cry to him, verse 15, but that you praise him. You praise him for his love. You praise him for the wonderful things that he has done because you were dead, Ephesians 2, and now you are alive. 
What I hope you're beginning to see here is it doesn't matter what your hardship is, Yahweh God is the answer. It doesn't matter where you found yourself powerless, only the God of heaven has the power to deliver you. It is absolute trust in what God can do. The third stanza in the middle here is interesting to me, verses 17 through 22, because on the one hand, it's very much like the second one. It's super clear, verses 17 through 22, that I'm in trouble because I was a fool, that I've done some things. But for me personally, I kind of look at it as a progression. You know, maybe I'm out there wandering, and I don't know what's going on, and I lean on God. Maybe, part two, I'm just caught in sin, and I'm not a Christian, and I obey the gospel. But even after we obey the gospel, even after we've cried on the name of the Lord and praised him in some songs, I still do foolish things. I gave you four seconds to amen, and nobody did. You do foolish things too, don't you? He's freed you. He's worth everything. He's worth your whole life. We talked about that in the parables this morning. We ought to give every ounce of who we are, but we live in this flesh and we do foolish things. So for me, when I read this third section, it's not the imprisonment of being utterly lost outside of God. It's the distresses that I bring back in even as a Christian from foolishness that brings things into my life that God never intended. Let's just look at it again. Verse 17. Verse 17. Some were fools. They rebelled and they suffered for their sins. In this verse 18, they couldn't stand the thought of food. They were knocking on death's door. In other words, they're like the prodigal. The prodigal son was in the arms of God. He was rich in the arms of God, but he decided, I think I can do better. And so he runs off into the world and he forfeits what he had. And what he finds is the only thing that's out there is spiritual poverty. Sean and I were talking about that this morning would have been a nice add to our bible class spiritual poverty and so i've been foolish and all i bring upon myself is the thoughts of knocking again on death's door and i added it to the text but when i was preaching to myself this week i thought knocking again on death's door i was at death's door i was lost in my sin the lord saved me from my sin i had my sins washed away i was added to the body of christ and yet for some reason every once in a while i just sneak back over to death's door again and kind of knock on it I don't even want what's behind it. Why am I knocking on it? That's the foolishness of the way we sometimes live. So what do I do if you're going, man, that's me. I don't know. I just turn back to it. Not sure what I was thinking. You know what you do? You cry, Lord, help. You cry at verse 19 in your trouble. And he will save you from your distress, verse 19. He will send out his word, his powerful word, and he will heal you. And he will snatch you back from the door of spiritual death for sure. That's a promise. Maybe all kinds of doors of death. Have you noticed that spiritual death and physical death have an interesting interwoven relationship in behavior? I think we learned that in the garden. But he's going to expect some things for you. If you go to him and you cry for forgiveness, as you and I both do, and if you do the dumbest of things and you expect him to pull you back, verse 21, he's going to expect you to praise him. Praise him for his great love. Praise him, verse 21, for the wonderful things he has done and more. And I think this is because we already kind of know better. Verse, I'm talking about verse 22. We already kind of know how this works. We know he's the answer. We've cried for him again. We've been through this before. This time he says, I also want you to offer sacrifices. I want you to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, and I want you to sing joyfully about the glorious acts of God. This isn't just a phone a friend. You know, you don't go do foolish things. You call and he bails you out and you go off and do whatever again. When we cry, Lord God, for help and he answers, we are indebted to him. I was reading some interesting things this week, not on my notes here, so I'll keep it brief, but reading some interesting things this week about how the first century Christian would have understood grace and works, which is a topic that we bring up very often. And what they had back then is they had this common partnership in New Testament times between a benefactor and a patron. And the way it would work is, you know, let's say you wanted to start some business or do something. Some benefactor with money would come in. Let's say it was was Sam. You're dressed nice. You're the the benefactor. And he sees me and he comes and he says, Chris, I'm going to do some things for you. And he, he funds my business. He gives me business advice. He handles my problems. It's almost a little bit like the Godfather. Like he handles, he handles my problems for me. Okay. He says, I'll take care of that for you. Like that's what he does. This is first century thinking. So he provides me the capital I need. He provides me the guidance that I need. He provides me. I get in trouble. I go to him. He fixes it for me. I've got things that are happening from some guy up the street. He takes care of it for me. But as a he does all that. But as a result of that, I become indebted to him. 
And really the interesting thing about the, the patron relationship of the first century is it's not that I pay him back every week. I don't think I could ever pay him back. But I stand up for that guy. And I talk good about that guy. And I, if I ever can do anything to help that guy, I do it. That was the relationship in the first century. And it was the context in which grace and works were told to us. And that's what this is talking about. I cry to the Lord, my benefactor, and he gives me something that I do not deserve. And he handles my troubles and he brings me back from my own mistakes. But now I am forever indebted to him to praise his name. That was a big part of the first century relationship. You say nice things about him, you speak up for him, and you serve him. And so it is here as well. And then the fourth one in the list kind of comes back away from sin again. I'm making the argument perhaps that the first thing is not necessarily sin. It's just the wilderness. And the middle two things are definitely the result of our bad behavior. But then we get to the last thing. When you're just staggering in your restlessness. I could have worded it better, but you see what I was doing there. I couldn't get away from it. It all had to line up. Look with me again. I'm in the text and I'm in verse 23. He said, some went off to sea in ships. And again, I don't want you to necessarily see sinful behavior here. Now we're just back living our lives. You're out there plying your trade. You got a job, you're at work. You travel for work, you're on the road. You're just out there kind of doing the things that you need to do. Verse 23 says, some went off to sea in ships, plying the trade routes, and they observed the Lord's power. Boy, his works are impressive. And you're seeing all the things that God can do all around you. But some of those things are testing you. And what they started to see is that God can raise up the wind and cause waves to start crashing over the side of the boat. And this has to remind you of the the Sea of Galilee stories and the testing of the people of God while Jesus was either walking on water during the storm and they were terrified or Jesus was sleeping in the bottom of the boat and they were terrified. In both cases, God caused the storm, not because they'd sinned, but because it was time for testing. What are you going to do while you're out there applying? You're free in Christ. You've been saved. It's wonderful. And you're praising God on Sundays. But what are you going to do on a Tuesday when the wind kicks up and it looks like the whole thing, your whole life's just going to flip upside down? Are you going to run terrified? Are you going to cry or are you going to cry to the Lord? There's a difference. Are we just going to be the kind of people who run inwardly and doubt things? He said, look, it's going to happen to you, but you know what you do when you're reeling, verse 27. When you're staggering like a drunkard, when you're at your wit's end, that's a term we know, verse 27. You turn to the Lord God and you say, Lord, help. They cried, Lord, help in their trouble. He saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper. You say, why did God calm the storm? When I asked, because the storm was a test of your faith. It was there to see who you are, and where you would turn. Do we understand that about life's troubles? Now, again, I'm differentiating from consequences of sin or punishment for sin, and I'm just talking about the way life comes at you to test you. In every situation, in any situation, every child of God will cry, Lord, help. And what will the Lord do? He will calm the storm. He will still the waves. What a blessing was that stillness. And it's interesting that he speaks like in past tense, verse 30 as he brought them safely into the harbor. What are we supposed to do when God brings us through? When we turn to him and he answers, you praise the Lord for his great love, verse 31. You praise the Lord for the wonderful things he has done. You exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. That's how this whole thing started. Has the Lord redeemed you? Were you hungry and hurting and didn't know where to turn and he put food on your table? Were you enslaved in sin and he broke you free by the blood of Christ? Were you foolishly walking back to death's door and you cried like the prodigal and he embraced you and slaughtered the fattened calf? Were you just trying to live your life and the storms were about to drown you and he lifted you back up? Tell people if you've been redeemed. The way we show gratitude to the Lord is by speaking his name. Folks, evangelism is not just this thing we do because we're supposed to do it. Sharing the gospel is the thing that Christians do because God is our Lord. Because we cry to him and he hears us. And we're facing all the same problems the world's facing, and yet we find our hope in him. Look, it's not complicated. Verses 33 through 38, it's not complicated. It's actually pretty simple. God can go both directions with the situations and elements of life. He can take the rivers, he can turn them into deserts. He can take the spring of water, he can turn it into dry land. He tells you why. Wickedness. If you choose wickedness, 
Just know that God can come in and he will come in. And on the last day, without a doubt, he will come in and he will take whatever water you had in the cup and he will dry it up. But that same God, when we cry to him for help, verse 35, that same God will turn your deserts into pools of water, your dry land into springs of water. He'll bring the hungry and he'll settle there. And he goes on to talk about this in verses 39 through 43. When bad things happen, he'll take care of it. I trust him. If people oppress you, he'll, he'll handle them. I trust him, and he will restore us. Verses 42 and 43, the godly will see these things and be terrified. The, godless will, the, God, the godly will see these things and wander around aimlessly for another year. The godly will see these things and be glad. It's the wicked who are struck silent. Those who are wise will take all this to heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. So I, I love this psalm. I, I just wanted to talk to you about it. I got three little simple things that, that were my practical takeaways. I read the psalm, read it a few times, and I thought, okay, what does this look like tomorrow? What do I need to do? So I'm going to share with you three things, and I'm going to read three New Testament verses that we know really well, except I'm going to read it in this strange NLT version. Okay, so go to James 1. Let me give you three things. Three things to think about. The first one is absolutely 100% the hardest and yet it doesn't ask you to physically do anything. I think sometimes we just want to do the hard physical thing, and then we'll be good with God. The first thing is the hardest thing, and it doesn't require any outward behavior or action. Number one, hardest part. The hardest part is there must be no doubting. You have to come to a place in your heart where you believe that every time you cry to the Lord, he hears you. You have to come to a place that it doesn't matter what's going on in the desert or on the sea or as a result of your own stupidity. It doesn't matter what it is. I cry. He hears. He answers in his way, in his time. But I trust him that he will provide everything that I need. Because here's the problem. If you go this week and you cry, Lord, help for everything. Oh, Lord, help. Lord, help. Lord, help. But in your mind, you're like, I don't think the Lord's going to help. You know what we call that? self-fulfilling prophecy. If you cry to the Lord in doubts that he will help, he will not help. Listen to James 1. We know this passage really well. Verses 5 through 8. James 1 verses 5 through 8. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God. and He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as the wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. The very thing we're trying to avoid, I guess. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they're unstable in everything that they do. Kind of reminds me of that thorny ground a little bit, doesn't it? Call on the Lord, call on the world. Love the Lord, love the world. If my prayer life is, Lord, I'm going to call to you, but in truth, I know that I'm going to have to go fix this myself, or I'm going to have to just wait it out in the world, then we will not get it. That's the hardest thing you'll ever be asked to do, is to cry to the Lord in every position in life and know that he will answer. There must never be doubting. And if there is, well, we're doing some evidence this class right, classes right now. We're trying to help our kids grow up with full confidence in God. Let me give you a second thing. Go to 1 Timothy for this. Just a couple of familiar readings as we close out. First Timothy, I cannot find it in this Bible. Does anybody know where it is? First Timothy, uh, there it is. All right, First Timothy chapter 1. Number 2, please remember that your past is a part of your story. And the reason that I bring that up has to do with the way that the psalm actually began and ended. The psalm began with, has, look backwards. Has the Lord redeemed you? Because if the Lord has past tense redeemed you, then you ought to be telling everybody about that. You shouldn't be walking around going, I don't know what God's doing, and I don't know if it's going to work out, and I'm not sure where to... Has the Lord redeemed you in your past? Because let's start talking about that again. And that's what he said in verse 43. He said, you need to see the loving kindness of God in your history so that you can draw the faith to have it in your present. 
your past is a part of your story. And, and I just thought about First Timothy. I actually thought about it just before I got here. In First Timothy chapter 1, where Paul is going around talking about how God redeems and how much God can do, and he's trying to send them this message of, of restoration. And he said, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, First Timothy 1, 12 who has given me strength to do this work. He considered me trustworthy, he appointed me to serve. Verse 14, how generous and gracious the Lord was. Verse 14, he filled me with faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. Verse 16, God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience, even to the worst sinners. You know what Paul's story was about how great God is? how great God was. I'll tell you how great God is by showing you how great God was. I was destitute, he redeemed me. I was off course, he corrected me. I was lost and he saved me. Because of what he did, I know what he can do. But I'm going to challenge you a little bit because I think people like to tell their old good stories to help other people through their present distresses. Are you going through something right now? Boy, that's tough what you're going through. Let me tell you that a couple of years ago, I was going through something really similar to that. And boy, it felt just like your situation. But I cried out to the Lord, or I prayed to the Lord, or I turned to the Lord, and the Lord helped me. And because the Lord helped me, I know the Lord can help you. Is that a good thing to do with people? It's really good. But would you do the same in your own life that you would do in other people's lives? Some of those same people who are willing to counsel others. Oh, I went through that five years ago, and everything worked out. You're going to be fine. Face their own problems tomorrow and fall apart. Remember, what has happened in the name of God in your past is a part of your present and your future. I remember, I don't know, like 15 years ago, I was preaching something on this topic, and, and I mentioned, look, you know, we've all been through some things. Some of us have been through some really difficult things. But everybody in the room still has all 10 toes and all 10 fingers. That was a mistake. A guy in the back sort of went like that to me. He, you know, hey, hey. And we got to the back, you know, and we talked about it, and of course, I, that was not a good illustration. But, you know, we laughed about it, and he was really cool about it. And, the, you know, the point in the end was he lost three fingers, but he's still here. God brought him through. It doesn't always look like you want it to look, but God brought him through to continue to do the work of the Lord. God has brought you. God can bring you. God will bring you. I think it's in 2 Timothy 1 where it says, God has delivered me, God delivers me, and God will deliver me. How do you like that? How do you like that? He has, he is, and he will. Go to 2 Corinthians 12, last point, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. One more thought here, because we might have this idea that, boy, if I read the Psalms every day, and I read Psalm 107, and I go to God, and I'm all in, and I'm not doubting, and he's done so much for me before, and I'm going to put this problem to him, and the Bible says that he helps, and he's going to fix it, we might miss one kind of simple idea. So I want to finish with that. You know, he's only going to restore that which he approves. And you might be like, hey, wait a minute. You know, I'm a Christian. He's going to approve me. He will approve you, but he may not approve every calming of every storm that you want. Some of it is we cry to the Lord. We go, Lord, get me better again. Help this person with their health problems. Change this economic circumstance. Make things better in these relationships. And he always hears and he always answers, answers and the answer is always good. But the answer may not be what you wanted. This is where that first thing gets really tough. When you're in a situation that you believe by all means God should change and you go to him and you believe he will change it and he doesn't change it and you start to question God. What we need to be questioning is, is the thing that I wanted the same thing that God wanted for me? Well, that's a tougher question because I know that it is the thing that God should do for me. But what do I know compared to the creator of the universe? Almost nothing. I just wanted to read these familiar stories as we close, but it reminded me of 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. You know the case of Paul. God said yes to Paul a lot. He delivered Paul from, from slavery, for, from imprisonment. He delivered him from oppressors. He delivered him from the slavery of his own sin. And, and in verse 7, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given that thorn in the flesh. A messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time God answered, my grace is all you need. 
My power works best in weakness. So now he said, I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Look, if you're weak and God wants to make you strong, that's a mistake on your part. If you're weak in an area, if something's broken and God wants to fix it, you need to go to God in faith and believe in God's help and he will help you. But if you are weak in a place where God wants you to be weak, where this is a part of your story, this is how you proclaim the grace of God, then request a change. But every answer from God is a good answer. And every child of God receives an answer from God because he loves us. And when we cry, Lord, help, and we do so with faith, good things happen. So I don't know. Just thought you might enjoy Psalm 107. I sure enjoyed talking about it. Give it some read this week. Try some different versions. In whatever way you do so, cry to the Lord for help. In any trouble, in every trouble, cry to the Lord for help. Do so in confidence. Do so leaning on how far he has brought you thus far. And then don't forget James wrote in his letter to pray, as the Lord wills. If the Lord wills. You know what that means? It means, God, help me if you helping me honors you. I asked this in a class a couple of months ago. Would you want God to give you something you wanted if you knew he didn't want you to have it? Would you want God to fix something that's broken if God preferred it to be broken? That's where real faith comes in and says, I will receive your answer and whatever it is, because I have cried to you, I will praise your name. I will praise your name in the congregation. I will offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and I will cry out to you in praise. And that's what the Psalms do. They teach us to praise God in everything. Praise God in all of it. Are you ready to praise God? You want to praise God? We're going to sing some songs here as we close. One more song to praise God. But if you need help, you are surrounded by people, agents of the Lord, to help you. If you cry, he will listen and he will answer. So cry to him for help as we stand together and sing.